Loving Father, we thank you for your word. May it be a word we hear with our hearts and our minds, that our lives may be transformed ever more to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do be seated. Nag, nag, nag. Nag, nag, nag. That was certainly the technique technique used by our daughters to try to get what they wanted. And it's a technique used now, without a great deal of success, I hasten to add, by our granddaughters. Now when I first read the passage we heard today from Luke's Gospel, nag, 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 seemed to be the technique that Jesus was advocating to his followers if they wanted their prayers to be answered. Jesus seemed to be saying, If we just keep on and on and on, if we simply keep bothering God, as the widow kept bothering the unjust judge, then God will give in and give us whatever we are asking so so that we do not wear God out by continually coming. But I wondered, is this the way to be successful in our prayers? Are we to be like the widow in the story and just keep nagging and nagging and nagging until we wear God out and finally we are granted whatever we desire? The answer to my questions seemed to be a resounding no. A resounding no. Because my initial interpretation of the story did not sit very comfortably with my understanding of how God works. I needed to reflect a little more deeply and a little more openly to the truths within this story and the passage within which it is placed. The story that Jesus told was told to his followers because they were losing heart. They may have felt that their prayers were not being heard that God was simply choosing to ignore them. Or they may even have felt that God had simply deserted them. Now the passage does not tell us directly what the followers were praying for, but we may infer from the detail that the widow who kept coming to the judge was seeking justice, that Jesus' followers were also seeking justice. Perhaps they looked around their world and saw great injustice. The unscrupulous gathering more and more wealth to themselves. Beggars being brushed aside like so much trash. Women being regarded as nothing more than breeding stock and men's servants. Perhaps they looked at the injustice practiced by their religious leaders, petty rule makers fastidious keepers of religious rituals who paid scant attention to the will of God. Perhaps they saw the injustice of Roman occupation and the puppet kings that the Romans had installed. Against these injustices and no doubt many more, they may have prayed and prayed and prayed, yet nothing, nothing had changed. God, it seemed, had not heard their cries. Or if God had heard them, then God had chosen to ignore them. God had not stepped up, acted, and answered their prayers. It may have seemed to them that their time spent in prayer was simply a waste of their time. It can seem that way for us. We pray so often for peace in this world, yet we daily hear of wars. We pray for wisdom for the leaders of nations, businesses and religions, yet too often we we see short-term, self-seeking, destructive decisions. We pray for justice, yet see injustice prosper in so many ways. God, it seems, has not heard our cries. 
Or if God has heard them, then God has chosen to ignore them. God has not stepped up, acted, and answered our prayers. It may seem to us that our time spent in prayer is simply a waste of our time. Yet, yet Jesus tells us a story about persistence, about keeping on and on, about not giving up. Jesus radically affirms in the face of the experience of his followers then and his followers now that God will grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night. That God will quick, quickly grant justice to them. This affirmation seems to be in denial of our experience. Where is the promised justice. An answer to this painful question may lie within our understanding and practice of prayer. Do we see prayer as a wish list to a fairy godmother who will grant us all our wishes, especially if we keep nagging and nagging and nagging, like my daughters did then and my granddaughters try now? That's why I ask that we change the word our in our prayer on page 6 of our service sheet in the fifth line. Change our to your. I don't want God to fulfill my desires, to grant me all my wishes. I want God to fulfill God's desires for me. God's desires for me. Do we see prayer as a means of whereby God will hear all our worries and concerns. Worries and concerns for ourselves, for those we love, and for this world. And then do we expect God to act, to sort them all out for us? Do we see prayer as God, do we see prayer as asking God to be a Marvel comic superhero who will, we hope, swoop down and sort out all the problems of this world and all the problems of my life if I or we would simply ask. Or, or do we see prayer as our drawing close to God? Drawing close to God. Yes, to tell God what we want. Yes, to share with God all our worries and concerns and to ask God how we may, be God's, we may be God's superheroes in this world. Should we see prayer as our drawing close to God? Drawing close to God so that God may help us see the flaws in what we want, that we might thereby gain a little more of God's wisdom. Do we see prayer as drawing close to God that we may share our worries and concerns and see them with God's timeless perspective? Do we see prayer as drawing close to God that we may be challenged to act for God? We may be challenged to act for God in this world. Should we see prayer as an opportunity, an opportunity for God to fulfill within us the promise we heard from the lips of the prophet Jeremiah. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Let this be our prayer. Let this be our prayer then justice will reign within our hearts, be spoken in our words, and be acted in our deeds. Let this be our prayer. A prayer that we make, not just today, but every day. Let this be our prayer. That we draw close to God, so God may change our hearts and write his laws in our heart.